Howdy, welcome to uh, our final event for this week uh, for Virtual Campus Sustainability Month. Uh, had some really great presentations. Thanks to everyone who has been participating. We're really happy that you're here with us today. You're kind of finishing off your Friday work day with us here. And we have a lot, uh, have a really, another really exciting talk for you today. Uh, Shreya is here. She's gonna talk to us about uh, colorism. And this is a really um, interesting topic that I, it's something that I think a lot of people maybe haven't really thought much about. You've probably heard a lot about racism, especially lately, um, but kind of a facet of that is colorism. And that's what Shreya is going to explore. So really interested in learning more about that topic and hopefully you all are too. And before we get to that, I just want to go over a couple of our just kind of, you know, uh, maintenance kind of issues. So uh, first, we would like you to turn on uh, side by side mode. It's the best way to view this presentation. If you look at the bar on the bottom right, you have that option to turn on that feature. We'd also ask that you turn on subtitles if that's something that you would like to do. Um, that option is available for you. Please keep your mics muted throughout the presentation just to make it a little bit easier for us to listen to what Shreya has to offer. And during her talk, if you have any questions that come up at any time, drop them in the chat. And at the very end, we'll have a chance to do a little bit of a discussion with Shreya and we'll ask her those questions. The more questions you ask, the better that discussion is gonna be. And sometimes the discussion can be even more interesting um, than everything else that's going on. So definitely hope we can have a really nice discussion. And if you don't, if you don't wanna put your question in the chat, there's also the raise your hand feature when I see that I can call on you. And since there's not a whole lot of us on the call, you could also just unmute yourself. You could turn on the, off the video to make it a little bit more interactive. If you, if you feel comfortable doing that, you could ask your questions then. Um, aside from that, I want you to know about a couple things happening in the Office of Sustainability. Uh, first is our Sustainability Champion Awards. Uh, students, faculty, and staff can all get an award, so um, award for each of those groups. And they're gonna be rewarded for what they're doing on campus to make campus more sustainable. And you can nominate yourself, you can nominate others. It's just a great way to get recognition and make more awareness for the importance of sustainability and the people doing great work on our campus. We also have the Sustainability Internship Program. Um, Shreya is one of those interns, and we're going to open those applications up for spring 2021. We'll open those up on October 26. Check your campus-wide email. We'll post things on social media and also be on our website. So look out for that. And also prizes, we have those for participating. So let me tell you about how you can win, win some prizes. So there's going to be a code word um, during this presentation. Shreya might say the code word. Um, I might write it in the chat. It could be written on a slide somewhere. But you have to pay attention. And once you do um, hear that code word, write it down, keep track of it. Because those code words, if you get two of them, you get a water bottle. If you get three of them, you get a t-shirt. You see you have a couple color choices on the screen. If you get um, five of those code words, we'll give you the water bottle and the t-shirt. And um, what we want you to do is after you've watched enough of these presentations, and even if you have all five code words, watch more of them, please. The whole, this is all about education and supporting our students as they're presenting this, this information. But once you've collected the code words, um, email those in one email to sustainability at tamu.edu, and we'll make arrangements for you to pick up your prizes. You will have to pick them up here on campus in College Station. We're not able to ship those. Um, but those are available for you to pick up. I'm going to explain to you how to do that when you uh, collect them and email us. And also, you don't have to watch this live to participate. You can participate all the way up until November 9th. The, code, these, uh, the recorded links are going to be on our website. They'll also be on our YouTube channel. Um, and from there, uh, Shreya is going to now take over. Take it away, Shreya. It'll teach us about colorism whenever you're ready. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, you can see it, right? Yeah. Yes. Cool, oh, cool. Hello, everyone. I'm Shreya Viravelli, and I'm a sophomore food science major. And today I wanted to delve into the topic of colorism and how it affects different groups, and with an emphasis on how colonialism brought rise to the ethnocentric beauty standards of lighter skin. So what exactly is colorism? It is important that colorism is not to be confused with discrimination or racism. Discrimination is something that anyone can face. Racism is discrimination that systematically oppresses people of color and ethnic minorities. Essentially, colorism is just another facet to racism, where there is discrimination persisting between the very tones of individuals. 
like light versus a darker skin tone. Often colorism is seen within communities of color, and this can be seen in more detail in the next slide with the consequences of the paper bag test. But just for a brief overview, overview, basically the shade of a paper bag started to become a standard for worthiness among those who were lighter skinned and darker skinned. All of these stigmas associated with darker skin tones stems from colonialism and the upper class narrative, which we will talk more about later on in this presentation. In the US, it all started with the introduction of slavery, where lighter skinned enslaved people were given less grueling tasks, which were inside, whereas those who were darker skinned were outside with the more grueling and more tiresome tasks. Another factor to why lighter skinned enslaved people were favored for indoor tasks was often because they were the product of a slave owner raping a slave, um, thus creating a lighter skinned individual. Originating from the early 1900s, the paper bag test escalated colorist stigmas. The paper bag test started due to the popularity of jazz and demand for young performers who were primarily black. And as a criteria to be hired performers, they had to be lighter than a brown paper bag. Many other businesses typically headed by white people also adopted the paper bag test as a criteria for hiring. Black people had to be lighter than the paper bag to be able to be hired, and naturally, job security and the quality of jobs received by individuals causes divisions and hierarchies within communities. As such, anti-blackness within the black community surfaced, and light-skinned people were often considered upper-class members of black society, and as an equivalent of worthiness, black people were held to this paper bag standard. Even today, I would say there are still discriminatory hiring practices whether industries are conscious of it or not, there definitely is a pattern to be noticed. Just as the music industry developed the paper bag test, colorism definitely persists today within, within the choice of popular artists and the lyrics written by rappers. For example, in a 2017 interview with Kodak Black, he stated his preference for lightening, lightened women to darker skinned women. Kodak isn't the only artist guilty of like singing any colorist lyrics. There's Chris Brown, ASAP Rocky, Lil Wayne, and just so many more. Here are some examples of lyrics that are often seen with, within these artists' songs. Um, they're in red on the slide. These men, these men are a few of the artists who reinforce the skin color hierarchy in their lyrics, primarily to reference sexual interaction. Colorism operates on multiple levels outside of just physical admi admiration. It affects courtship, marriage, incarceration, housing, income, education, and mental health. Colorism definitely affects people differently. And as you can see through these lyrics, woman being referenced the woman being referenced introduces another variable consistent with colorism, gender. In the American contemporary music industry, the normalization of colorism, specifically gendered colorism, both lyrically and vis visually has produced often known as the Holy Trinity singers, Beyonce, Rihanna, and rapper Nicki Minaj. They're position positioned at the forefront of black female artists. They are all very talented individuals, but they definitely represent the accepted physical depiction of black women where lighter skinned rappers are considered more beautiful because they are closer to the more Euro Eurocentric beauty standard and are also considered more sensitive than their darker skin rapper counterparts like Megan Thee Stallion or City Girls who have been called masculine, tough, or more aggressive. I believe this just shows how dark skin has been dehumanized and light skin is more praised and revered, whether it is intentional or not. Although I don't have a whole slide dedicated to it, I do want to touch on how light skin black men are still more likely to be hired than darker skin black men. Light skin men earn an average of eight to 15% more than their darker skin counterparts. Um, it's also important to note that colorism is present all over from the music industry to the entertainment industry and all over the world. In many countries, colorism stems from white supremacy. Colonialism has served as a system that led to the emergence of such colorist ideology. I wanted to touch on, the, on colorism in the Latinx community for a quick second. I feel as they're a community often overlooked in association to colorism. Um, and I think that's largely due to the way that, that 
the community structure and how they presented themselves. There were concepts called mestizaje. Um, but nonetheless, there are many who are of Afro descent and there are people who face discrimination and internal oppression. According to a Washington study, around one third of the population in Latin America is of African American descent. Internalized oppression and the ideology of whiteness led to phrases like, led to derogatory phrases like Halo Malo, um, which describes Afro-Latino hair negatively. Going back to this concept of mestizaje, which is to un unite everyone um, under one ethnicity or one gender, like there's no differences basically. But with that, it also perpetrates this kind of colorblind society. And this just means they're not offered any compensation, for lack of a better word, for all the injustices and the discrimination they face. In the Asian American community, a darker skin tone is associated with a lower socioeconomic class because a darker skin is, tone is associated with someone who labors or to toils in the field. Whiteness is revered in post-colonial countries as it resonates to an elevated status. Thus, also, it becomes a marker for, be for beauty. Such internalized colorism is what leads many parents to infringe upon their children whitening skin products, like the ones that I have um, on this slide. The skin whitening business has become a multi-billion dollar industry with Asia as the primary market. And according to a study done by Harvard, they estimate it to be worth around 23 million by the end of 2020. Um, next up, I wanted to talk more about the Asian American community because as a member of it, I've firsthand seen how colorism works its way into conversation, friendships, marriages, and so many other areas. So many of my friends worried about going outside when it was too sunny. They would skip out on events so that they would not have to go outside and like retain their fairness, right? Um, I mean, who can blame them? Like we grew up surrounded by colorism. Friends and family would talk about how beautiful someone was just because they were lighter. Or as children, we would notice how someone was treated better or spoken to more respectfully than someone who is darker. Naturally, like we want that affection and treatment given to us, so we would do anything to achieve it. I also remember growing up how I was spoken to by family or other well-wishers. I was a very active child and I always loved being outside. So naturally, I would get darker. And whenever I'd see family or relatives who would see me or see pictures of me, they would say, oh, Shreya, you were so beautiful, which um, in my language just means, oh, you were beautiful, but you lost your color. Um, that's quite literally the direct translation of that. It's kind of ironic since technically I was getting darker and that means I would have had more color. Um, but I, I know that there's a lot of people who are trying to, you know, we want to make ourselves look better in the community and, you know, not hear negative things about yourself. So naturally my mother, um, who only wanted the best for me and didn't want anyone to say anything negative about me, would try to keep me inside or advise me to use certain whitening products. I mean, I don't blame my mother for anything. I know that she was just looking for the best for me. And she would always just tell me how beautiful I was, just the way I am. But in order to protect me, she would advise me to use certain lightening products. Like my mother, there are so many who unknowingly gave importance to colorism in order to protect their loved ones. Obviously, the best way to combat those, um, those remarks would, those who would say such things as like Rangu Poyindi and stuff, would be to educate them and help them realize what they are saying is harmful. Because I, I really do think sometimes they truly don't realize what they are saying is harmful and they're just being well-wishers in their own way. That's just how deeply entrenched the mindset of lighter skin is in Asian countries. And um, sayings like Rangu Poyindi are not unique to my language or culture. Such demeaning phrases are prevalent all over. We've already talked about Pelo Malo, and another example that I can offer you is in Pakistan, the Shidi community, who are descendants of East Africans, are constantly ostracized. Um, and there are terms in Urdu, which I have listed over here um, on the slide on the left-hand side, um, that are used to negatively describe them. Um, a lot of the people in the Shidi community live in poverty and are constantly subjugated to harassment, hate speech, and just so much more. And something else um, that deepens the colorism prevalent in Asia is the entertainment industry. And one such example is the Bollywood industry. Also on the 
right hand side I have a, um, some ads used by skin lightening companies um, portraying how fairness is equivalent to beauty okay the Bollywood industry in India is notorious for rather blatant colorism you might have already heard of the song that recently came out called Kali Pili. Um, in it, there is a lyric that translates to, when you dance, watching you, oh fair skinned girl, Beyonce will be ashamed. This song sparked a lot of outrage, especially with the current climate, which challenges any racism or colorism, which is definitely a good thing. Um, this song is just one example amongst many that promote color prejudice. These songs in the industry just reinforce the glorification of light skin in Bollywood movies. Something else the Bollywood industry is known for is brownface, a process that involves intentional darkening of an actor. They would rather do this than actually hire performers who naturally have darker skin. For example, in the popular 2019 film Bala, um, it features the story of a woman who suffered discrimination on the basis of her skin tone. The woman was played by um, Bumi Pednikar, who had to have her skin darkened in order to play the role. Many pointed out the irony of the film's promotional posters where the character was surrounded by skin lightening products, but is actually light skinned and in brown face. The, the blue poster, that's the promotional poster that I was talking about just now. Um, another rather controversial actress in the Bala movie is Yummy Gautam. She is in the pink in this picture that just pulled up. Um, she was for the longest time the primary face for Fair and Lovely, um, a major skin lightening brand in India. Um, I actually have an example of her in her ad. Um, yeah, she, she's the top one. That's Yami Gotham. Um, she she was for the, like she was the primary face for Fair and Lovely and everything. Um, when she went through, um, when she was acting in Bala, she said that she, there was no problem promoting the brand, that there are fairness and tanning creams abroad. But the idea to show that not being fair is something to be unhappy about, that's not right. Gautam may have been the primary face for Fair and Lovely, but maybe acting in Bala was kind of her realizing the issue of colorism, or honestly, it could have just been tokenism. But Take what you will from that, but I thought that was just something interesting to note. Colorism in India may have escalated due to colonialism, but it certainly was present before, as there are links to caste. Sociologist Sanjay Srinivastava, who works at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi, says Hindu religious texts are full of what we would now recognize as racial stereotypes, lower caste figures as dark and ugly. Thus, the association of fair skin as a mark for class became prevalent. However, it is important to note that the arrival of pale-skinned British colonial leaders in the 18th century definitely had a role in deepening the prejudice of color. Um, also, the code word is succulent, so like write it down if you want to. Um, okay, now on to how we can confront colorism. Acknowledge and understand how colorism manifests within you. If you have benefited from colorism, understand the privilege you hold and how you have benefited from it, and use where you are to elevate others and make this issue more known. Furthermore, if you have been harmed by colorism, remind yourself that society's dated traditional beliefs, like they should never dictate how you feel about your attractiveness. And remember to have those difficult conversations with family members who are offering you those skin lightening products or compare you to a lighter skin cousin of yours sit them down and let them know why colorism is harmful and what they are saying is detrimental. And rather than not seeing color, we should uplift and empower everyone equally, regardless of their color. Um, these are some of my sources. And um, the lighter blue ones are more sources for if you wanted to read more into the Latinx community, because there's definitely a lot more than what I touched on. And I think it's something important that everyone should look up and read into. Um, anyway, thank you for listening to my presentation, and let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Shreya. Really well done. Uh, definitely uh, learned a lot. I already see some someone's uh, put in some couple claps in the chat, so I think uh, really, really good job. Uh, really um, 
interesting topic that I think a lot of people could learn a whole lot more about. So thanks for introducing us to this uh, concept and teaching us a little bit more about this and especially kind of talking to us about kind of some of your own personal kind of um, experiences. So that was really impactful for me, um, ex especially. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we'd love for you to drop those in the chat so we could have a robust uh, discussion here uh, to get us started while hopefully y'all are thinking of a question or two to ask. I guess first, uh, Shreya, could you just tell me like what kind of got you to like start thinking about this topic and what made you interested in learning more about colorism? Um, definitely, like I said in my presentation, I just saw a lot of like family and friends really like be affected by colorism. Like um, growing up, it's almost, it's so normalized, like, like fair and lovely, like products like that, like, oh, to use them and to be lighter and not go outside. That's always like it's so normal to just be like let me just stay inside um rather than go outside you know enjoy my time you know but um and i like realize like especially with you know um the current climate of like blm and everything like racism really putting into focus i realize like how normalized colorism is in society and definitely i think this is an important topic to talk about and make people aware of so would you say that this is like a topic that maybe you've learned more about recently? Um, or have you thought about this for a long time? Sorry. I have definitely like been aware of it and I've known, like I like I was always annoyed with it. So I've definitely been aware of it for a while, but um, looking at like different like communities and how it affects other cultures and stuff, I didn't realize how much it affected other um, communities. I just only knew from my viewpoint. So it was very interesting to see all that. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. And yeah, again, thanks for sharing that. I know it's not always difficult to talk about those things. So appreciate that you're you willing to do that. Um, so I have some more questions, but we do have someone that asked a question in the chat. So they were they were wondering, have you yourself ever used any uh, skin lightening products? And did you feel like you needed them to be considered beautiful? Um, I actually did use them when I, I, ref like I refused to wear sunscreen or any like fair and lovely or any products like that because I was just like, I like who I am. I wanted, I want me to be me all the time. But definitely there are those times where you give in, where you want to like look a certain level of attractiveness, which we've established like that isn't there. Like you are attractive in your way. Like you shouldn't change yourself for it, you know? So I think that's like, I have used them, but I know that like, I wasn't as deeply affected by it because I was always um, very, like, what's it called? I was very passionate about not using it, but I know that a lot of my friends and family were, um, you know, more inclined to use it. Okay, and then I guess talking about that skin lightening products, I was wondering, like, it, are those safe for people to use or is there some kind of medical um, issues as well that we, people might want to consider if they don't, you know, that's the only yeah. thing that they care about? Um, there's, I, like, I know some of them are known to have bleach. They did say that they changed the product, like, formulation and stuff. I don't know what it currently has, but I would think that if you're not, if you're trying to, like, lighten your skin color, that's definitely something not natural, so I would assume that it's bad for your skin and harmful for you in the long run. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Um, I guess the other thing that I was uh, wanted to talk to you about is like, I guess like uh, mental health. Have, did you look into anything with mental health and kind of like some ramifications for, for colorism and how that impacts people? Mm -hmm. And we talked about it a little bit, but I thought maybe, maybe you could talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I think um, it definitely affects mental health because it's just where, who we are isn't enough for society and you want, to obviously like be enough, you want to feel worthy. So I think it can, it would be lead, like leads to self image issues and just like how you present yourself or sometimes you'll avoid talking to certain people too and like not think that you're worthy. And like, uh, I think like that's where a lot of it is. Like you just don't feel worthy enough because society says so, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a couple more questions that I can ask and I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in um, in the meantime, but, you know, uh, I guess the, the other thing that I was kind of, I was wondering about, you, you know, you were talking about how we sometimes will see these lyrics, these colorist lyrics that are happening in like popular hip hop songs and, and things like that. Um, 
so it kind of reminded me a little bit of the paper bag test that you were talking about um, in, in, you know, in the, in the jazz industry and how that was like the, the, um, the owners of those clubs were typically white owners. And that was kind of how that paper bag test originated. And I was also, and you, and you, start, and you see some of, you know, you know, you're seeing these lyrics in hip hop. Um, and obviously these are black artists. Um, um, however, the artists that are actually like chosen to be played on the radio that are elevated to popularity. Um, did you kind of see anything that was sort of similar to that paper bag test, like kind of, you know, who was actually chosen and not, and who are those gatekeepers? Yeah, definitely. I know like, um, like I talked about the Holy Trinity, Beyonce, Rihanna, and Nicki Minaj, like um, they are considered lighter skinned. And I know a lot of people who are darker skinned, they couldn't rise to a lot of fame. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Georgia Smith. Um, Georgia Smith, she actually acknowledges her privilege and she says that I feel like I'm only up in the industry because of my skin and because of my privilege, like the pretty privilege, essentially. And um, I, I, like, in the, we, like I talked about with Megan Thee Stallion and um, City Girls, how they're darker skinned and they, you know, they're, like more aggressive in society or tougher or less sensitive. And I think that causes different people to what's rise up and become more famous, you know? So that's why we, I feel like, especially, I feel like now it's a little bit better. I think more people of all skin tones are kind of sh um, showing up more and are able to like come up. But I definitely think like, especially in the early 2000s, you definitely notice a lot of 2000 or uh, lighter skinned people. Yeah, definitely. And I guess I was I was also kind of getting at that, like the same way where you have kind of like white um, club owners, it's really tied to white supremacy. Um, you also kind of see that as well in the music industry. It's like the, the, the folks that are able to sign artists that are in charge of record labels, in charge of radio, um, they're the ones kind of elevating which music is popular and which music isn't, are very often white and very often male. So again, kind of tied to that white supremacy as well. So I, want, I wanted to also kind of make that connection. Um, and then looks like we do have a comment, and just a comment of thank you for sharing those very personal thoughts and feelings. I think those are really impactful for a lot of us. I know that took a lot of courage to be able to share that with us. So again, thank you for that. And I guess I'll just ask kind of like one last question. Um, you were kind of, you, you kind of briefly talked, I mean, you talked about Bollywood in a lot of detail and you kind of briefly talked a little bit about Hollywood. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious when, you talk about, um, you know, you talk about those, the musicians that are elevated because they have a lighter skin tone. And I, we, I know we see that in Hollywood as well, but if you kind of like looked at um, like the roles that are given kind of based on skin tone. In Hollywood or in Bollywood? In, in, you, in Hollywood typically. And I mean, you, if Bollywood, if you have, I, if you'd rather talk about Bollywood, then you could answer it that way too. I can talk about both of them real quick. Um, Hollywood, I actually, like, I did notice that um, um, like Zendaya, uh, who else, Yara Shahidi, and, ooh, there's, and Amanda Steinberg, I think, yeah, they are lighter skinned people, and they're very talented people, but, um, they're often the more chosen ones for, I would say, like, teen shows or something like that, rather than anyone who's, like, darker skinned, especially for, like, main roles, um, that was something that I read about, and, like, I didn't notice until I read about it, and I was like, that's true, like, I don't see a lot of um, darker skinned people chosen. And when they are chosen, uh, they like, they don't always play the most like respectful role. Not that like all, all roles are like very good and all, but sometimes they play the more sassy role, you know, like the stereotypes that are um, put upon like darker skinned women, I would say is also the roles that they're given in the industry. Um, and and in kind of like side roles, kind of side roles, not like the main roles too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in Bollywood, um, like darker skinned actors, they don't really get to come up. I would say that like, if there is a darker skinned person needed for a character, a brown face or something like that would definitely be committed. And um, yeah, it's just really hard, I feel like, for anyone who's not lighter skinned to come up in the Bollywood industry. So like rather than use a darker skinned Indian actor, actors, they would use makeup and use brown face. So sort of like how in the United States we used to have blackface where you have white actors and actresses that were playing what they thought black people were supposed to be. It was very stereotypical. Is that kind of how you, it plays out in Bollywood today? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions that I have. Um, I don't, I don't, it doesn't look like any other questions came in in the chat. Um, but thank you so much, Rhea, um, for that. I, I definitely learned a whole lot. And before I let y'all go, uh, it does, we have a way to go, Trey, uh, Trey from, from in the chat, I think. Um, some clapping hands, so lots, lots of love coming your way. Um, I just want to quickly share my screen, let y'all know what's coming up next. Uh, so uh, on Monday, we have uh, Jessica's going to talk to us about geoengineering. That should be a really interesting conversation, uh, something that a lot of people haven't thought much about. And uh, I think she'll present it in maybe a different way. So definitely encourage you to check that out. It's at 10. And then right after at 11, Kendall's going to be talking to us about endangered species and how those have been impacted by COVID-19. And that's probably something I'm going to guess most of you haven't thought about. I know I certainly hadn't thought about it before Kendall um, created this presentation. So please check those out. And um, I I'm not going to write the code word on the slide um, again. Shreya did say it one time in the presentation. And since she said it once, I think it's fair to say it at least twice. So I, I will repeat it. It is succulent, succulent, you know, plants. There is a succulent in her room somewhere. And so that was where that came from. Um, but that's the code word. So uh, that, that's all we have for you today. Please have a nice, uh, safe Friday. Make sure that you are, if you go out, that you are wearing your mask, that you're social distancing. You know, this pandemic is far from over. Um, and please join us on Monday. Join us at 10 for Jessica and 11 for Kendall's talk. And just again, thank you, Shreya. Great job. A uh, little bit of a round of applause for her. Excellent work. And we'll see you all later, y'all. Y'all take care.